Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, bettingangle.us.com. It is Monday morning, July the 29th, 2019. This is the Monday after this weekend's mass shooting, about a half an hour from here in Gilroy, California. Let me first open by saying my prayers go out to anybody who was negatively impacted by that shooting. Right? Trust me when I say that the community has galvanized around what happened and is taking action. There's a lot of compassion here in the Bay Area, which, let me just say, I'm very proud to be a resident of. Now, it's mornings like this where you really value community, right? Let me just say, let me talk about a community that I visited that I value greatly, and that's the community of Baltimore, right? Just understand, people who have visited the town know that Baltimore is a town with a rich culture and tradition, both in the past and the present. Understand, this is the town, this is the land of Johnny Unitas, of Lenny Moore, of John Mackey, of Frank Robinson, of Boog Powell, of Jim Palmer, right? This is the land of the BAA champions from 1947 and 1948, right? The Baltimore Bullets, who beat the New York Knicks and the Philadelphia Warriors on the way to the title. Now, this past weekend, 14,686 people came out in Baltimore to support Gervonta Davis, super featherweight champion. Now understand, Davis has had 22 fights. He's had 21 knockouts. He's an unbeaten fighter. While Davis looks young, understand no one has gone the distance with Gervonta Davis since October of 2014. Now Davis is a southpaw He's on the short list, we'll call it, of the hardest punchers in the sport pound for pound. Right? Let me just say I'm going to exclude heavyweights for a moment because when we say pound for pound, we're really trying to shine a light on other weight classes. Clearly, Deontay Wilder. Clearly, Anthony Joshua. Right? Even after the car crash is one of the hardest punchers in the sport. On this list of the hardest punchers in the sport, I believe you have to include popular names, right? Golovkin, Canelo. I believe you also have to include less known names, right? Anthony Yard at light heavyweight is one of the hardest punchers in the sport. No question about it. There is an open question on whether the man he's fighting next, Kovalev, is still one of the hardest punchers in the sport. Right? I would say, based on what I've seen, Callum Smith is one of the hardest punchers in the sport. Well, this is necessarily, necessarily, has to have Gervonta Davis. Not surprisingly, Davis's nickname is Tank, right? Because he hits like a tank, because he comes forward like a tank. Now, he was fighting Ricardo Nunez, and Nunez didn't look that bad. But sometimes the crowd gets to you. Now understand, the 14,686 people who showed up, according to reports, is more than the crowd that showed up 
for Keith Thurman versus Manny Pacquiao. Right? Boxing has stumbled onto something here. Right? In my opinion, one of the best run leagues in the world is the National Football League. And one of the reasons the National Football League is well run is because that league has a team in Green Bay, Wisconsin. In other words, that's a league that's savvy enough to have teams in places like Green Bay, places like Kansas City. Right? They're connecting with fans who aren't Wall Street bankers or the Hollywood acting elite. Right? They understand that you connect to the heartland because the heartland is where many of your fans are. Now, boxing here in a sport that is increasingly dominated by Las Vegas, and understand Las Vegas delivered less than 10,000 fans for heavyweight champion Tyson Fury's last match. Right? New York City. Madison Square Garden, where Andy Ruiz took the heavyweight title, right Barclays Center, Deontay Wilder's favorite stomping grounds. Just understand the sport of boxing is bigger than that. Just look at the boxers themselves. Right? While you do have some guys who came from money, right? Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Right? Most of the fighters, if you research their backgrounds, came up dirt poor. Right? These are guys from the hood. Even the fighters who got more attention than others did in turning pro, the guys who got a bonus, understand, often that bonus was $50,000. Right? For a world class prospect, $50,000. Now, woohoo! Right? Understand, my local mailman, who may or may not be a world class prospect or mailman, gets more than $50,000 a year as a matter of course. Understand, the money in boxing is slim, it's few and far between. Don't get fooled by the money being made by those at the very top. Right? So you're talking about guys from single-parent households. You're talking about fighters who, quite frankly, have had to support their single parent once they started getting enough money to afford a mortgage. You're talking about fighters who understand that it's tough for them to get a bank loan. When I lived in Southern California, I was reading an article on a champion at the time, Hernando Hernandez, right? The guy who Floyd Mayweather beat for his first title. And Hernandez was talking about how hard it was for him to qualify for a mortgage. This, this was a world-class fighter, folks. He was talking about he really had to become champion to be able to go into a bank and have them trust his future income stream. So what I hope boxing does, and I understand hedge fund money runs longer than the money from a blue collar city, right? But boxing needs to cater to the Green Bays of the world, to the Baltimores of the world, because that's where your fan base is. Right? When you show up in Baltimore and more than 14,500 people come out for a fight, you need to cultivate that area. Right? If you've ever seen a Terrence Crawford fight out of Omaha, Nebraska, and you look at the emotions and intensity in the crowd, you understand that boxing has got to find a way to put on more events in Omaha, Nebraska. Let me just say this to boxing. The 14,686 people who showed up for the Gervonta Davis fight, a fight not at heavyweight, 
a fight that generated more people than some heavyweight title defenses, should draw the attention of every promoter. Right? I hope boxing gets it together. And I hope boxing understands the cultural significance of having a sport with blue-collar roots connect with blue-collar fans. Now, let's get back to the fight. Nunez isn't doing badly, folks. He ties up Davis. Now, as I've said here online many times, clinching. You don't think about it. You think about the punching, right? But clinching is one of the most important skills to have in boxing. If you don't do it right, it could cost you the fight. It may have cost Nunez yesterday. He clinches Gervonta Davis. Now understand habit, understand Davis, right? You clinch a guy, often you're trying to tie up his right hand. Right? Because most fighters are right-handed. You want to tie up his dominant hand. You want to tie up the hand that has the big punch in it. So Nunez ties up Gervonta Davis. The problem is, this is an event. There's little margin for error. You're in the ring. You want to take the crowd of more than 14,000 people out of the fight because this is Davis's backyard. This is Davis's crowd. Right? So Nunez is caught up in the moment. A lot of emotions. Right? It's like attending a wedding or a high school graduation. Right? A lot of emotions. So Nunez ties up Davis like one would normally tie up a right-handed fighter. Folks, the problem is Davis's southpaw. Davis gets his left hand loose. Here's another problem. Davis is great at short range. Right? Think Errol Spence. In other words, Davis doesn't need you being far away from him. Davis is coiled and ready to hit you hard. So he's tied up one minute. He gets his left hand loose. Right? Nunez is a little bit nonchalant with Davis's left hand. Normally, that's a jab hand, right? No, that's his dominant hand. Davis unleashes a left hook. You wonder how he gets the leverage, right? His feet are pretty much together. Davis just leans back, has total body control, as great punchers do. Right? You know, they say, hey, you're born a great puncher. I believe it's like throwing a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. For whatever reason, the guy has the body control and the coordination to put it together. Davis is a big puncher. Folks, the world changes after Davis lands that first left hook off of the blown clinch. So Nunez then makes a bunch of mistakes. You're fighting an explosive puncher. I've said this, by the way, in talking about other Davis fights here online. Right? Look up the other, the last, Gervonta Davis video I did. I was wrong on it. I thought his opponent would do better. In that fight, his opponent, I think his name was Hugo Ruiz, decided he was going to back up against the ropes. That was a bad decision in that fight. Guess what Nunez does? Now, granted, understand, hindsight from the safety of this seat, where I'm not semi-conscious after getting hit with a wicked left hook out of a clinch. Right? I'll agree. Hindsight's 100%. In the ring, you're woozy. You've just been hit with a bomb. And Nunez had his wits about him. Against a guy like Gervonta Davis, big hitter, but a guy who comes straight at you. Nunez should have pivoted toward the middle of the ring. Give himself room. The last thing you want to do is to give yourself no room against a puncher who's more conscious than you are 
after he's landed the first big punch. No. That's not what Nunez does. Nunez doesn't pivot to the middle of the ring. Nunez doesn't try to use lateral movement. Nunez doesn't just try to walk away from Davis. Get out of the hot kitchen. Right? You know his left hand is lethal. You felt it. Walk away from the left hand. Right? Move away. Davis also has an excellent jab. Moves your out of jab range. Right? Some guys will even grab a hand. Floyd Mayweather against Shane Mosley. Right? Mayweather gets hit with Mosley's right hand. Mayweather grabs that hand. He's not going to allow Mosley to throw the hand again. Right? Couldn't fully clinch Mosley because Mosley's a vet. Mosley's not close enough to get clinched. So Mayweather grabs his arm. Nunez doesn't grab Davis's arm. He doesn't pivot to the middle of the ring. He doesn't use lateral movement to get away from Davis. What does he do? He goes over to the ropes, folks. Gets blasted. Now let me just say, the danger level in boxing is extreme. In the last two weeks, two very good fighters, two fighters on the rise, lost their lives. Right? You cannot allow, you simply cannot allow a heavy-handed guy like Davis to hit a guy in the head too many times. So a referee like Harvey Dock is trained to see when a fighter's hands drop, when a fighter becomes defenseless. Right? In boxing, we want to make sure that a fighter can defend himself. He can be buzzed. The fighter has to do things to defend himself. Grab the other guy's arm. Clinch the other guy. Bob and weave. Have a hand up. Look like he's blocking shots. Throw some shots back. Instead, what happens is Davis comes over, lands some hellacious shots. That first left hook opens the door. Davis goes over. He has Nunez pinned. Right? Nunez is on the ropes. I know there's some controversy about the end of the fight, but what I want people to do, and I have the highlights in my favorites folder here, is to look at Nunez's arms. Right? Just look at his arms. If his arms drop, because that's what referees are looking for, that's what Harvey is trained to look at. If a guy's hands drop and he's defenseless against a big puncher like this, right? The referee, especially since Nunez has no place to go, right? The referee is well within his right to stop the fight. Here's what I saw. I know Nunez is trying to look tough and stuff like that. And let's be clear, too. In boxing, sometimes the referee has to protect warriors from themselves. Right? These guys are accustomed to getting hit with shots most of us have never been hit with. Sometimes you see a guy getting battered and you know in the guy's mind. The guy's thinking, man, if I could just clear my head and shake this off, I'll be okay. Right? I'm just telling you that the stoppage, in my opinion, was warranted. What I see with Nunez with his back up against the ropes is he gets hit with a shot where the ropes hold him up. Right? He goes straight back, bounces off the ropes. That could have been called a knockdown. But let's be clear. It happened so fast. And understand, referees are a little bit off at the side. Right, They're not immediately between 
the guys. Sometimes, because the ref's looking at a guy's back or a guy's shoulder, or is looking at the arms of the guy getting hit, the referee might not see things as clearly as the camera. So understand, anytime the ropes hold you up, if I get hit and I fall into the ropes, and but for the ropes, I would have hit the canvas. A ref is well within his right to step between the fighters and start a count. The ropes can't hold you up like that. Right? Harvey Doc doesn't call the knockdown. He lets the sequence continue because it's going 100 miles an hour. Right? Davis, again, one of the hardest punchers pound for pound in the sport. Better than 90% KO percentage. Davis steps on the gas, hits Nunez with other shots, and Nunez's hands drop. And Nunez looks like he's going down. The problem is he doesn't go down. He's open for other Davis shots. In my eyes, Harvey Doc did the right thing. I applaud Harvey Doc. Right? Boxing's a sport. No one should be getting severely injured. Right? Once Nunez's hands drop, he can't defend himself. He's on his way to being put to sleep. Right? You know what happens? A guy's hands drop. He's clearly out of it. Then rather than get hit with that next punch, the ref stops the fight. So the guy then has a chance to come to his senses. And when he comes to his senses, he realizes he's lost the fight, a fight he's trained weeks for. Right? And he's upset with the stoppage. But what I want people to do is to look at the entire sequence. Nunez is so out of it that when Harvey Dot steps between the two guys and waves off the fight, Nunez literally falls into Harvey Dock. Right? Nunez is so out of it. If Harvey Dock is not there, at a minimum, Nunez staggers forward. Worst case, Nunez would have staggered forward and hit the canvas. So I applaud the stoppage. Right? Davis here didn't tie up fully his left hand. It was a mistake. Right? Nunez seems to be trying to conduct psychological warfare to let Davis know, hey, you're not that tough. Nunez may even have figured Davis doesn't have enough room here to hit me hard. His feet aren't far enough apart for him to get leverage. Well, he was wrong about that, folks. As I said, a good short puncher, that's an art, right? Getting leverage during a boxing match to throw hard punches, that's an art, right? That first punch, literally, Davis is being held. Davis gets his hands clear. That first punch is about this far it travels. Right? Davis gets a hand free. Nunez is right here. Nunez is holding his other hand. And Davis is able to get off a shot that knocks Nunez semi-conscious, opens the door to the other shots that end the fight. Now, let me just say this. Many elite fighters. Davis has already beaten a guy who I feel had better boxing skills than Davis, but didn't have Davis's punch. Jose Pedraza. As I sit here today, I'm still shocked Davis won that fight. Right? But understand, boxing really is a sliding scale. You can be the better skilled boxer and still lose. Because the other guy has the punch and has a bigger margin for error. The other guy has taken your shots, you can't take his shots. 
Now, let me just offer some criticism of Davis. This will sound hard, but understand. We're here to look at both the positive and the negative because we're trying to assess betting opportunities, right? Understand, one of the fighters who wants to fight Davis was on the car. It was Yorkies Gamboa who looked great against Rocky Martinez, right? Gamboa's right hand was popping. Gamboa has knockout capability. Now, what's a vet like Gamboa? What's a vet? like Lomachenko looking at and feeling that Davis is vulnerable. Let's offer a few thoughts. The first is while it's a positive, it shows his punching power, that no one has gone the distance with Davis since 2014. Right? Understand a skilled fighter, a boxer, a guy who's been to the later rounds, against some of these hard-hitting lions, might feel that Davis is untested later in fights. That Davis really hasn't been in the ring against a world-class guy where Davis needed a second win and it's very late in the fight. Eighth round, ninth round, tenth round, do you know how Davis is going to do if he doesn't have a hand speed advantage and he's in against a mover, right? Who's either smothering his left hand, which would be a bad idea since Davis can shorten it, or is moving away from Davis's jab. Davis has a very good jab. Is moving away from Davis's jab and is popping Davis with his own jab. Being a child of the 1980s, I feel Thomas the Hitman Hearns, a taller fighter who could work behind a jab who destroyed Roberto Duran in Duran's worst fight. I believe uh, Thomas the Hitman Hearns would beat Davis. I think Hearns would hit Davis's head with his jab. I don't think Davis moves his head well. And I think Hitman had the right hand that he could throw behind the jab to take Davis out. I also think Hitman had the lateral movement to stay away from Davis. Right now, you don't really have that tall guy. Maybe it's Robert Easter, but you don't have the tall guy with Thomas Hearns level power to keep Davis outside. Right? And make Davis pay. Make Davis have to walk through hellacious shots. Right? Understand, Hitman wins the title at 147, almost takes Marvelous Marvin Hagler's title at 160. And let's be real. Right? Hitman, quite frankly, was ahead on the scorecards against Ray Leonard the first fight and clearly beat Ray Leonard in the rematch in the 1980s. Well, let me just say this. A guy like Vasyl Lomachenko, lateral movement, ambidextrous, hand speed, right? Would Davis be able to find Vasyl Lomachenko in the ring? Right? Vassal can load up on shots. Didn't Vassal drop Jorge Linares? Understand, I know many of you are saying Davis is a 130-pounder. Vassal's 135, but Davis has had weight problems in the past. Well, if you look at this Nunez film, you're going to see the openings experienced fighters think they have. When Davis opens up on Nunez... Right? He's wide open for counters. Now, it could be that he opens up on Nunez because he knows he's hurt Nunez. So, maybe in the ring, in the moment, he's assessed that Nunez isn't a risk to hit him with clean counters. Right? But Davis on film looks open for counters. Davis on film does not look defensively blessed. He has a big head. It's a big target. He's coming forward. You don't see him really 
with a back foot game, right? You know he's trying to soften you up with his jab so he could come in with big left hands. You know he also has a right hook up front. Now on the telecast on Showtime, I believe it's um, Al Bernstein who points out that Davis does throw a lot of punches well, right? But Davis doesn't look particularly fast in the ring. You get the feeling a smooth fighter would be able to use lateral movement outside if you can get Davis turning. Maybe you dissipate his power. Understand, even Jose Pedraza, who got stopped by Davis, wants a rematch against Davis, right? This is not the fighter whose films people look at and are afraid to fight him, right? This isn't Davis's mentor, Floyd Mayweather, where people looked at films of Mayweather and thought too fast, too good a boxer, too good in the pocket. Here, Fighter after fighter looks at films of Davis and says, gee, this guy's not defensively blessed. This guy might telegraph when he's throwing punches based on how his feet are. This guy doesn't look like he's the most diligent in camp, has had weight problems in the past. Right? Then they see the mistakes that fighter after fighter makes against Davis. Right? Back up against the ropes, not a good idea against this fighter, right? So just understand, Davis looks vulnerable on film to some. Now let's talk about Yorkies Gamboa, right? After Jason Sosa, an excellent fighter, took Lomachenko to the later rounds, but lost to Lomachenko, right? Got stopped. Uh, Sosa's corner threw in the towel. That's a trend in Lomachenko fights. Understand that Sosa then fought Yorkies Gamboa. Now, I know Gamboa's 37. But understand, Gamboa has already been in the ring with people like Orlando Salido, Terrence Crawford. Here he's in the ring with former champion Rocky Martinez. Right? I'm just telling you, this was impressive, right? I'm just telling you that if you look at the Gamboa resume, the fact that he beat Sosa, tough fighter, the fact that he beat Rocky Martinez, and I know Martinez was away from boxing for a while, came back and stuff like that. But just, you know, it was Martinez's second fight in the last three years. But understand, Martinez clearly could not take Gamboa's punching power. And let's be real here. Gamboa looked too fast for Terrence Crawford when they fought. He had Crawford in trouble during a moment in that fight. Right? Open question on whether Crawford's ever had that level of difficulty with any other opponent. Also, if you're going to fight a Gervonta Davis... You don't want to be the young man who has a lot of testosterone and wants to prove something to the crowd by staying in the pocket, like Nunez was. Right? You want to be the older fighter who understands. Tank owns the pocket. I'm not going to stick around to get hit with left hooks here. I need to get on my bike. I need to force this young lion to get to the later rounds. I need to make his level of preparation and stamina an issue. You also need an old guy who has been in marquee events before. So when he shows up, and there are more than 14,000 fans rooting for Gravante Davis, you need the old guy who can still maintain focus. Right? Yorkies Gamboa's hand speed is still there, folks. Yorkies Gamboa's right hand is still there. Power is the last to go. Right? Let me point out, too, if you look at the film, the stoppage of Rocky Martinez is a punch tucked in a combination. 
You'll notice the fast hands Gamboa has and the power Gamboa can drop in the middle of a combination in that last sequence where he stops Rocky Martinez. So to the city of Baltimore and to promoters everywhere, let me just say you have something special here. You have a boxing culture that can generate 14,000 people for a non-heavyweight title fight. You also have a fighter who some very shrewd people in boxing, Tevin Farmer, for example, Yorkies Gamboa, Lomachenko, Pedraza, want to fight. A fighter who is unbeaten with a greater than 90% KO ratio, who has one of the hardest punches in boxing. Right? He's that rare fighter where you understand, hey, I can't miss the first two rounds of a Gervonta Davis fight. Because there might not be a third round. Right? So kudos all around. Let me congratulate Gervonta Davis. Right? Whatever vets think looking at film, when they get in the ring, sometimes they're proven wrong, as Pedraza was. This is special punching power and warrants everyone's attention. Let me close this video with a tip of the hat to the city of Baltimore. Let me know what you think. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. What happens if Loma fights Davis. And yes, I'm expecting Loma to win his next fight. Right? What happens if your Keith Gamboa at 37 faces Davis? Understand, Gamboa's been going the distance lately. Didn't this last fight. But Gamboa is proven in the later rounds. Right? Could Davis hang at 135 pounds? Let us know your thoughts. Thanks for stopping by.